Have you ever wondered how a clock works? Well, clocks have evolved throughout the past several hundred years, but it wasn't until 1927 that J.W. Horton and Warren Morrison invented something called a quartz oscillator to be used in a quartz clock. Now, these are timepieces several times more accurate than the clocks of the day. And today, we actually still use quartz oscillators for almost all appliances we have to keep time, like watches and wall clocks, phones, computers, digital displays, cars, they all use quartz oscillators. You can even see on some clocks it says quartz. But what is a quartz oscillator? Well, a quartz oscillator is kind of like a watch's heart, and it beats like a little heart. Well, more like it vibrates. But unlike a human heart that speeds up and slows down due to a variety of causes, a watch's heart stays at a steady rate. And unlike your heart that beats around 60 to 100 times per minute, a watch's heart beats at 32,768 times per second. So yeah, pretty fast. And the way a watch's heart vibrates is actually pretty interesting. Have you ever seen a tuning fork? They look like this, and when you hit them, they vibrate to produce a sound. Now, longer and bigger tuning forks sound lower, and thinner and shorter tuning forks sound higher. Now, as you might imagine, the tuning fork inside your watch is pretty small. It's only about four millimeters wide, and when it vibrates, it creates a really high pitch. And that's actually by design, so that when you hold your watch up to your ear, you don't hear this annoying high-pitched whine. But yes, dogs can still hear it. And this tiny little 4 millimeter tuning fork is made of quartz, and it's specifically designed to vibrate at exactly 32,768 times per second. Now I'll get to why 32,768 times in just a minute, but for now I just want to mention that because it's so difficult to manufacture the tuning fork to vibrate at exactly that rate, what manufacturers will do is they'll coat the ends of the tuning fork in a very, very thin layer of gold and slowly shave the gold off the end of the tuning fork before it vibrates at exactly 32,768 times per second. What's really cool about quartz is that it utilizes something called the piezoelectric effect. What is the piezoelectric effect, you ask? Well, if you take a piece of quartz and you hit it with something, like a hammer, or even if you just get it to bend a little bit, the quartz will send out a tiny pulse of electricity. And the inverse is also true. If you zap the piece of quartz with a bit of electricity, you can get it to bend or flex like it was being hit. But why does this happen? Well, the chemical name for quartz is silicon dioxide, meaning that on the atomic level, it is comprised of atoms of oxygen and atoms of silicon. Now, this is what a crystal of those atoms looks like. Atoms don't actually look like this. This is just a helpful way to visualize them. Anyway, something interesting about silicon dioxide is that the oxygen has a slightly negative charge, whereas the silicon has a slightly positive charge. This is because of oxygen's greater tendency to hold on to its surrounding electrons. And because electrons are negatively charged, the oxygen takes on some of that negative charge, leaving the silicon with a positive charge. Now in this model, the oxygen atoms are represented by these pink circles with the negative sign, and the silicon atoms are represented by these blue circles with the positive sign. Now something else interesting is that the oxygen and silicon atoms arrange themselves into this hexagonal structure. Now in a full crystal, there would be multiple hexagons stacked on top of each other and multiple spreading around in all directions too. And as you might imagine, when you hit a crystal of quartz in just the right way, it will compress slightly. But here's the interesting part. Before the quartz is compressed, look at the positive charges. The atoms are all symmetrical around the center. So the center of positive charge is right here, right in the center. The center of positive charge is kind of like the center of mass, except with positive charges. So the center of positive charges is right here, but what if we now hit the crystal and therefore compress it slightly? Well, then these two positive charges move outwards and this one moves up. So overall, on average, the silicon atoms have moved up. So the center of positive charges moved up. 
So now the positive charges are centered around this point. And the same is true with negative charges. Before the quartz is compressed, the center of negative charges is right here, right in the center. But after the crystal is compressed, these two move sideways and this one moves down. So overall, the center of negative charges moved down. So hitting the crystal has pushed negative charges one way and positive charges the other way. So one side of the crystal is more positive and the other side more negative. And now if you hook a wire between the two, current will flow. The negative electricity is attracted to the positive side of the quartz, so current flows through. And for the same reasons, the same happens for the inverse. So you apply a current and the crystal will compress or bend a little. Okay, now back to the watch. So let's bring this back to the quartz tuning fork. Now, each time the tuning fork bends, it sends out a pulse of electricity. Now, here's the thing. Just like with a normal tuning fork, a quartz tuning fork will lose energy and eventually stop vibrating over time. But a clock needs the tuning fork to vibrate consistently and not lose energy. So how does it do this? Well, think of it this way. If I give someone just one push on a swing, eventually they'll stop. But if we give them a push every time they come back, well, then they'll keep going. And keep in mind, we have to push them at exactly the correct time. Otherwise, if we push too fast, then this will happen. And if we push them too slow, this will happen. <laughs> so what we can do is each time the quartz tuning fork moves back is give it a little push. Keep in mind that the quartz tuning fork is vibrating, sending out a pulses of electricity each time it moves back and forth due to the piezoelectric effect. So the clock can do something really clever. The clock will take part of those electrical pulses and send it back around. And then the watch battery will amplify the signal slightly to send it back to the tuning fork. So the tuning fork is receiving electrical pulses at the exact same rate they were sent out. And when that electricity reaches the crystal, it causes the tuning fork to bend. Again, that's because of the piezoelectric effect. Another way to think about it is that the tuning fork bending creates electricity, then that electricity loops around, and then it causes the tuning fork to bend again. And the cycle keeps going. So just like in the swing example, the electricity can give the tuning fork a little push at just the right moment. So the mini tuning fork can vibrate forever, or at least until the battery runs out. So now that we have a steadily vibrating tuning fork, we now have a steady stream of electrical pulses traveling down the wire. So now back to the question, why does quartz vibrate at 32,768 times per second? Well, if you know your powers of two, you'll know that that's two to the power of 15. So what happens in a watch is that these electrical pulses are sent to a series of 14 mini computerized flip-flops. Let's look at those flip-flops. Now this chain of 15 flip-flops is inside every quartz clock. Now needless to say they don't look exactly like this, but the mechanism is still the same. Now let's look at just the first flip-flop in isolation. Now when we get a pulse of electricity coming from the quartz tuning fork, the flip-flop will flip. It turns from the off position to the on position. And for every new pulse of electricity that comes, it turns the flip-flop either off or on. Now let's look at the first two flip-flops. The signal from the first flip-flop is fed in to the second flip-flop. And it works such that every time the first flip-flop turns back to the off position, the second one flips, either off to on or on to off. And this happens continuously as each new pulse of electricity is coming in at a steady rate. And as you might have guessed, if we look at the first three flip-flops, the same thing happens. Every time the second flip-flop turns back to the off position, the third one flips, again, either from off to on or on to off. And same for the fourth. Every time the third one turns back to the on position, the fourth one flips. And same for the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and so on. Now let's focus on how often each flip-flop is turning on. 
Keep in mind that the original electric signal from the tuning fork is coming at 32,768 times per second. So that means that the first flip-flop is flipping 32,768 times per second. But it only turns on half as often because it takes two flips to go from on back to on. So the first flip-flop is turning on 16,384 times per second. And it takes two flips of the first flip-flop to create one flip of the second flip-flop. So the second flip-flop is only turning on 8,192 times per second, half that of the first. And the third flip-flop turns on just half as often as the second flip-flop, 4,096 times per second. And the fourth one, half as often as that, 2,048 times per second. The next one, 1,024 times per second, 512 times per second, 256, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. That last flip-flop is turning on one time per second. And that one on per second can either power the ticking of a clock through the use of a step motor, or it can directly power a digital display. And that's how a clock works. That's how a clock keeps track of every second that passes. Even the way an everyday object like a clock works can be very confusing. And to make matters worse, over time, quartz clocks lose track of time. They lose or gain about a second every day or two. And that's because the quartz tuning fork isn't perfect. Things like temperature and pressure can change the vibrations of the tuning fork very slightly. And over time, this adds up. The difference really isn't enough to affect us. Being off by a few seconds really isn't that big of a deal but sometimes it is a problem. For example, things like GPS and the internet rely on extremely accurate clocks. So how do they get that accuracy? Well, they use something called atomic clocks. Now, atomic clocks are so accurate, they only lose or gain less than a tenth of a nanosecond per day. That's 0.0000000001 seconds. And atomic clocks are the focus of my next video, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching this video of On the Shoulders of Science. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Uh, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing or sharing this video with your friends. And if you have any suggestions for future videos, uh, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.